All right, well, I'm going to talk about our new version 6 of the UAH Global Temperature Data Set. This is something that uh, we've been working hard on for the last few years, and there were lots of times when I thought we were 98% of the way there. And I would tell people, just a few more weeks or just a few more days, and there'd be a problem that would pop up, and we finally, there were a lot of things we went back to ground zero and, and just started doing things differently, questioning how we had done things before. Uh, so anyway, here's just a quick word summary. Let's see. Uh, this is the most extensive uh, revision we've had in the 25 years of production. Um, entirely new software. Um, let's see. We've got an entirely new method for estimating lower tropospheric temperature. Uh, the original method that I invented and that RSS also uses uh, that uh, it's, I don't know whether it's been 25 years, something like that, since, since I came out with that method, I finally decided we shouldn't use it anymore. It's not good enough. So we came up with a new method for monitoring lower tropospheric temperature. Uh, we've got a new diurnal drift correction adjustment. Um, I'll mention that more here in a minute or explain what that is. Um, the new product has higher spatial resolution because of the way we do the um, lower tropospheric temperatures. Uh, let's see, our new trend, and this was unexpected, ended up actually being uh, a little below the RSS trend. This is since 1979, that's the decadal trend. We get uh, 0.11 C per decade since 1979, uh, which is really close to remote sensing systems product. Um, and we've cooled the last latter half of the of the uh, the record. That's just the way it turned out with all the adjustments, actually bringing us into very close agreement to RSS, which we didn't expect. It's just the way the numbers turn out. Um, and also with our new uh, products, we can monitor the tropical upper troposphere where the hot spot is supposed to be, and uh, a new method that we have for monitoring that layer specifically. Uh, shows new evidence of still no hotspot in contrast to what the climate models predict should be happening. And we're frozen up. There we go. Okay, so this is uh, monthly temperature anomalies for the lower troposphere. Uh, this is something that I update every month and put it on my blog at drroyspencer.com. Uh, basically showing the hiatus for the last 18 years or so. These are the layers that we monitor. Uh, this, the, these curves represent the, the vertical weight that uh, the satellite measures coming from different layers. Uh, so the horizontal scale is, is the weight or like the intensity uh, relative intensity that you get from different layers, and then the vertical scale there is height in kilometers. Uh, so the green curve is the lower stratosphere, that's basically unchanged. TP, that blue curve, that's the tropopause layer, which is a new layer for us to be monitoring. And then the black curves are our new lower troposphere, which can be con compared to the old lower troposphere, which is that magenta curve. Uh, and then MT is sort of a raw measurement uh, of, the, of the troposphere. So that just, just is just to give you some idea of, of what layers are monitored by the satellite. You know, these are deep layer temperatures. <clears throat> that dashed curve there I've got on there, I won't get into it, but basically that's the vertical profile of temperature trends uh, that come from uh, weather balloons showing stratospheric cooling uh, up above and then down below where it's warming. It, it, you know, it's showing fairly uniform warming with height. Okay, and then this is uh, just for this tropical upper troposphere product that we have. Um, that's the red curve showing the vertical weight and you can see that the vertical weight is, is perfectly positioned uh, to capture where the hot spot is supposed to be. That's that bracket there from the 7 to 13 kilometer layer. Um, so that's a new product that we're going to be emphasizing to try to track the, the existence or non-existence of the hotspot in the tropical upper troposphere. Okay, this is uh, 
a time series of the main, the nominal layer measurements, for instance, that green curve with the really big excursions, that's the lower stratosphere. Uh, there were big warm events from uh, El Chichon and, and Mount Pinatubo. That's what caused those warm events. Uh, and then the other layers are in different colors. I won't go into this just to say that, you know, these are the, the time series of the different layers, monthly temperatures since uh, 1979. Now, this is all the satellites that go into this monitoring. This is basically the same satellites that RSS uses. And, you know, sometimes the question is asked, why do you even adjust the data? Well, there's all kinds of things going on. There's a few tenths of a degree calibration difference between different satellites, and these satellites don't last for the whole 36-year period of record. So you have to pass off from one satellite to the next. You have to intercalibrate them. That intercalibration is usually a couple of tenths of a degree, which is on the order of what you're trying to measure for global warming. So you've got to take that out. But also what's shown here is it shows how these satellites drift in their local observation time. And just as you wouldn't monitor climate with surface thermometers by measuring a bunch of years at 9 a.m. and then, you know, the next five years at 10 a.m. and then the next five years at 11 a.m., uh, you have to correct for this diurnal drift that you're, you're measuring at different average times of day as the satellites drift in their local observation time. So these are all things that uh, have to be corrected for, but luckily there's only two or three main corrections that have to be done, but they have to be done well. For instance, this is the average diurnal drift effect we get from the satellites themselves. Uh, this is by comparing a satellite that's drifting with one that's not drifting. And basically what this shows, for instance, the blue areas show, uh, let's say, a tenth of a degree C uh, cooling per hour as the satellite drifts. And there's two plots because there are 7.30 satellites, ones that are nominally at 7.30 a.m. and p.m., and then the bottom plot is for the satellites that are nominally at 1.30 a.m. and p.m. for their observation times. So this is a plot of the drift in these satellites, and then we, we subtract this out of the satellite data as the satellites drift through time. Anyway, this is the final answer for the lower troposphere, the trends, not global average, but at the grid point level. And there's sort of rough agreement in the patterns between these patterns and if you'll look at the same plot from thermometer data. Um, the land in general has warmed faster than the ocean. And any time there's climate change, for whatever the reason, doesn't matter whether it's man-made or natural, the land is going to change faster than the ocean. So that's not a fingerprint of human warming. It's just a... It's just warming. That's the way it's going to occur. Uh, you know. So let's see. Um, I, I have no explanation for Greenland. See how Greenland shows, if anything, slight cooling? Um, these channels are sensitive to surface effects, and Greenland is high altitude, and it sticks up into the, uh, into the, the weighting function that the satellite measures. And so we're seeing mostly a surface effect over Greenland. And I really don't have an explanation for why that's different. It may be a surface effect with the snow that's causing cooling there. We really don't understand the surface emissivity changes in the microwave. These are all microwave measurements, by the way, in the 50 to 60 gigahertz band. Um, so that's, that's sort of an unknown of what's going on there. Also, Himalayas uh, is uncertain. And then Antarctica is also uncertain because you've got the same effect going on. You've got this big ice sheet sticking way up and uh, in the surface influencing the satellite measurements considerably. Um, this is a plot of trends for different, the horizontal axis is just different locations. For instance, the left end there is global trends, uh, and then global land, global ocean, and as you go across, this is just to show how our old version 5.6 data set, how the trends that we used to have have changed with new version 6, and there's some pretty big changes here, like in the Arctic. Um, those big humps there on the right, there's Arctic, Arctic land, Arctic ocean. Uh, the new version 6 has basically cut the warming trend in the Arctic um, in half. Um, let's see, you go a little to the right of that, you see the Antarctic is the only region which basically shows no warming trend at all, and I suppose that's you know, qualitatively consistent with the fact that Rather than sea ice decrease in Antarctica or around Antarctica, there's actually been a sea ice increase. 
But again, you know, these numbers are, are very uncertain um, uh, because of difficulties in measuring uh, around Antarctica or elevated ice sheets. Okay, uh, this is kind of busy, uh, but look over on the right. I've got two sets of observations there. There's the red squiggly line represents our satellite upper troposphere product in the tropics, and then the green, you know, very squiggly line next to it uh, is how much the surface is warmed. Um, so if we just look at the observations, and I've put the trend lines on there, if you look at the observations, those two time series and those two lines, you see that the upper troposphere, the new measurements we have of the tropical upper troposphere, have not even warmed as fast as the surface has warmed. Now, go farther up and look at the models. The models say the surface should be warming uh, faster than it has uh, by almost a factor of two. And the upper troposphere of the models, I don't have the squiggly line for that, uh, the trend for that should be way above what we're observing. So there's something going on in the tropical upper troposphere and uh, we don't understand it. I think it has something to do with how basically with water vapor feedback. My, my personal opinion has been, continues to be that um, that there is not positive water vapor feedback in the climate system on long time scales, and that's why the climate system isn't warming as much as, ex as expected. That's my personal opinion. Uh, but I think this is telling us something uh, important about how the climate system adjusts on long time scales to any kind of forcing. And in this case, I think it's telling us that, that the upper, middle and upper troposphere are not moistening in the long term uh, and not amplifying warming and that's why we don't see a hot spot. That's my opinion. Anyway, here's the data file locations. Uh, just a sub different subdirectory compared to, um, to where we used to put our products. And again, you know, I provide monthly updates at drroyspencer.com and Anthony usually echoes them within a day or two. Uh, so, you know, the data's out there if you want to look at it. And I'm going to finish with that. Thank you.